Introducing Punchbowl News. From Anna Palmer, Jake Sherman, and John Bresnahan. News about the people who matter, for the people who matter. Join the community at punchbowl.news. Well, good Thursday morning. I'm Anna Palmer, founder and CEO of Punchbowl News. Thank you so much for joining us for this pop-up virtual event with Senator Tim Scott, the Republican from South Carolina. We're going to focus today's conversation on getting the economy back on track post-pandemic, opportunity zones, and access to private capital. I'd like to thank the American Investment Council for their support in helping put on this event. As a reminder, you can find Punchbowl News on all social media at Punchbowl News. If you are sharing about this morning's event, I'm at at A. Palmer, D.C. Before we begin our conversation, I'd like to play a video before bringing on AIC CEO Drew Maloney and Ann Barnes, CEO of Intelligent Medical Objects. Private equity helped American workers and companies survive the pandemic, keeping Americans employed, supporting local businesses, all while supporting vaccine research. Even as things start to get better, private equity is still fueling the American recovery. All right, and with that, I'd like to welcome Drew and Ann to the conversation. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having us, Anna. Yeah, thank you, Anna. Of course. Well, before we dive deep into the conversation this morning, Drew, I'd love for you to just kind of set the stage a little bit for our audience on what exactly AIC is uh, kind of broadly. So AIC is the largest advocacy and research arm for private equity here in Washington. So um, we represent probably about 80% of all the assets under management across the country um, in private equity. And our goal is to educate policymakers on the benefits of private equity and private capital in uh, communities and where they, uh, where they live and operate. So AIC recently put out a report with a ton of data and numbers looking at the impact uh, private equity as an industry has on jobs. What is the your top headline from that report? I think that what we try to show is that private equity invests in every state and every district uh, across the country. And one of the challenges we have is that um, in communities across America, there isn't a sign out front that said this, co this company is partnered with or owned by private equity. So it's incumbent upon us to highlight these um, investments in people's districts. And, you know, just to show that, you know, just for example, last year we invested more than $650 billion in communities across the country. And 86% of those investments went to companies with 500 or less employees and a third were less than 10 employees. So I think what we're trying to show is how critical a role we play in the economic recovery. So I wanna to get to Anne in a second, but I do wanna ask you, because I think it's really important to set the stage for what we're talking about, about investment, about capital. We're coming out of a worldwide pandemic, a crisis where a lot of things shut down, were shuttered. Can you talk a little bit about the pandemic and the impact it had on private equity? And you, you said, you know, $650 billion in capital in 2020, despite it being going, uh, us all going through this pandemic. Do you expect these numbers to be able to grow or is that kind of the number in kind of size that you expect the industry to stay at? Well, we've been growing over the last 10 years. And I think what's very unique about um, private equity, and I think Ann can, can speak to this, is it's patient long-term capital. So when you have a downturn like we just had um, last year with a lot of economic uncertainty, especially around March and April and May, we don't have the quarterly reports that we have to be as concerned about. We can ride through that time period. We can work with the um, management of the company to figure out how to get through that time period and grow as, as we go forward. So I think that's one of the important aspects um, that we can do. And we have a lot of flexibility and we're much more nimble and I think that's really critical as we're seeing the company sort of emerge into this economic recovery period that we live in now. And I wanna to turn to you, you're CEO of Intelligent Medical Objects. Oftentimes in DC, as Drew certainly knows, we're focused on what's happening in the Capitol, kind of these broader, big political fights, but you're on the ground. You talk a little bit about the industry you're in, healthcare, uh, and the role that private equity has played as, as the country went through the, the pandemic as we've been talking about. Sure. Um... You know, 
healthcare has been a bit behind in technology and automation for quite some time. Um, and private equity has really played a strong role in helping smaller companies, founders with good ideas, um, actually accelerate and scale and grow and expand. We're certainly one of the companies Drew talked about. We're at about 300 employees. And um, during the pandemic, a big light really was uh, shown down on the healthcare data problem. Um, I think people realized during COVID that really identifying patient groups with underlying conditions and also COVID symptomatic, that it was really, really difficult to get at, at the specific data when you needed it, how you needed it. And so I think the, the natural evolution that was going on sped up quite considerably. And private equity is playing an enormous role across that healthcare data spectrum, across the healthcare sort of technology spectrum that's helping healthcare move forward in a much quicker way. None of these companies, including our own, would have the ability and the financial backing and sort of the longer view that Drew just referred to to be able to do that without strong investors, without financial acumen behind them. It's interesting because it's kind of the reverse of what I think has often been the perception of the industry, right? It's strip and flip and move, you know, kind of fast. What you're talking about is, is kind of the opposite of that. Can you talk a little bit about your company and what you see as a trajectory as you look to this kind of new investment in healthcare and data? And we think about, I'm sure, like virtual medical care, all kinds of things that are much more centered in terms of what we're thinking about going forward as an industry. Yeah, I mean, when you when you think about healthcare, the the available data about a patient um, is not good. It's not strong. And there's a lot of big players coming in and taking a look at that. And the ability for a physician to actually do their job with the patient and not be tied up in technology and distracted from the patient is an enormous problem. And physician burnout is an enormous problem. We're right in the center of that. So we're really focused on how do we get the physicians back to being physicians? And we handle some of that stuff behind the scenes in an automated way. And how do we get to a point where physicians can make better decisions because the data has been pulled out in a way and summarized in a way that it's fit for the purpose that they're trying to use it for? It's very, very difficult. And it's very uh, much put a workload on the physicians that's really brutal. And it's causing us to have fewer and fewer physicians going out into the workforce, which is an enormous problem for healthcare here in the United States. Private equity has taken a keen interest in healthcare IT and in data quality and data automation. And all across the board, many, many sponsors are stepping in and helping these companies move forward quickly. And based on the pandemic, we now need to move at a pace that's much different. You know, we've been growing at the 15 to 20% sort of growth rate consistently since our investment. Um, from our sponsor, but that's got to speed up now. That's not fast enough to actually take care of the adjacent markets and take care of the others in the ecosystem that need that. Life sciences is showing up in a much bigger way. The payers are showing up in a much bigger way and also need help. And so for companies like us to expand quickly into those other realms, we have to have a much bigger investment to be able to do that. I want to talk about another trend line that we're seeing and big issues underway right now is infrastructure and whether President Joe Biden is going to get a deal of some sort. Drew, can you talk a bit about uh, green energy products? I mean, that's certainly some projects. That's certainly something that this administration is extremely focused on. Uh, do you see that becoming a bigger mix in terms of the overall investment landscape? It's been a significant uh, improvement in, in investment over that over the last decade. And if you just look at the numbers from last year, there were about $55 billion of capital put into um, renewable energy and renewable investments. About half of that money, $25 billion, came from private equity. So in order for us to successfully get to the transition of cleaner, uh, cleaner energy sources, more sustainable energy sources, private capital is, is, is providing an enormous um, a, amount of energy to that space. And we're going to need that going forward. And I think that's one of the reasons that we share some of the same goals as the administration on sustainable energy and trying to bridge that gap as we go forward. And, and I think it goes beyond just the renewables. I mean, we have about $200 billion in infrastructure money um, sitting on the sidelines that's ready to continue to invest not only in renewables, but water infrastructure, um, and, and, and other uh, other items out there that are going to be necessary as we continue to grow the uh, economy. So we've talked a little bit about small businesses and the kind of role that private equity has been playing into some of these kind of, you know, more of a mom and pop, I guess, uh, shops. 
But can you talk a little bit about just the impact of the pandemic? I mean, just, you know, we're doing this virtually. Ideally, this would be in person uh, with a big audience. And we're, you know, kind of starting to think about going back, you know, back to that at some point. But has that had a big impact in terms of just being able to kind of assess businesses or help businesses? Has the industry had to kind of be nimble when it comes to the, to this new kind of telework situation? I mean, I think the, the advantage of, of private equity, and, and obviously Anne can speak to this, is that we are very nimble and um, we could easily um, shift to a much more virtual environment and, and, the, and our businesses that we're partnered with, we're, we could easily help coach them, identify people, figure out ways to help them grow. And I, I think you also saw a lot of the companies that uh, we own um, really stepped into the space. I mean, whether it was COVID testing, whether it was, you know, a great example is a Minnesota-based company called Victory Innovations. They manufacture disinfectants. They were a company when they were bought by private equity of eight people. I mean, talk about a real small business. It was eight people. Now they're more than 50 and the disinfectants are used in airlines, subways, and schools. And, and you saw that across the entire industry of people stepping up and trying to address the needs of their businesses and keep people employed as long as possible. And can you maybe build up on what, what Drew was talking about? Yeah, I mean, I, I think a couple of things. One is, you know, we didn't let anybody go during the pandemic. And, and we had sort of that safety net of our investors behind us so that we didn't have to make any rash decisions. Um, but certainly the, the other big advantage that we have is when you're part, when you're a portfolio on a private equity investment, um, you're a part of a family, right? And so throughout the pandemic, I felt like we had our finger on the pulse. We were on weekly calls as CEOs, hundreds of us, um, getting access to people in healthcare, people in the government to really understand what was coming next and how we could be front and center with our employees, front and center with our customers. That's, that's access that you normally don't have as a small business leader. Uh, and so that's really exciting because you just have a, a lot more resources and a lot uh, like sort of an extended group to lean into. Um, and private equity does such a nice job of bringing the information to you so that you're not trying to go find that and spending your time doing that. And that was true at all functional levels. We had CEO gatherings, but there were gatherings at every level, gatherings of growth organizations of how do you actually sell in a virtual environment? How do you meet your customers where they need to be met? So all kinds of um, help, help with the CFOs on managing cash. Um, at a different level during a pandemic. So lots of help that just we would not have seen on our own. In terms of that, I mean, are there things that you think you learned, lessons learned kind of in this weird environment that we've been living in? We were talking before we were um, on stage about kind of the getting back to normal, getting back to work. What have been either, you know, some challenges or things that you've seen that are actually maybe beneficial that we're gonna come out and, and maybe keep as business practices? Yeah, I mean, look, I think for our business, we're far more productive in this environment. Everybody's heads down, working harder, and our productivity levels went up substantially, which actually helped us in COVID because we work side by side with the CDC and release the terminology that goes out into the medical field. And so a normal year might have us doing six releases, and we had to double that during COVID because things were changing so quickly. So the productivity is a big positive, and we've learned that people can work at home and be productive. The challenge for us has been around collaboration and innovation, going beyond the group that you work with every day in that productivity. We've seen sort of those hallway conversations, those stopping by somebody's office conversations that really help companies move forward, stop. And so I think our new normal will feel much more like a balance, much more like a hybrid where we do want people to get back together. We do want them to come together and have those relationships, that culture, that chatting, that random conversation. But at the same time, we also can provide much more flexibility and know that people are very, very productive working from their home environments. I think the last thing we've done is just gotten better at understanding that hybrid model. So when you're in the office in a conference room and there's people who are remote, how frustrating it can be when you don't understand that everyone's shuffling papers and everybody's laughing and you have no idea why they're laughing and how sort of you know, distant you can feel. And so we want to do a much better job coming back and recognizing that there might always be people in the room and people remote. Uh, before I turn back to Drew, I want to ask you a little bit about re-entry. There has been a lot of conversations about 
women in the workforce and particularly the struggles is oftentimes they are the lead caretaker of families of, of all different, you know, whether it's children or elder parents. How are you navigating that as a leader? Uh, you know, do, are there best practices that you've tried to employ? Yeah, so I look, I think this is a crisis in America and I think nobody's paying enough attention to this, but the women in the workforce, we're, we're now down to 57% of women are in the workforce right now. That's the lowest level since 1988. I mean, it's, we've gone completely backwards and we had a long way to go forwards. So uh, that's a little frightening. And right now one in four women are considering exiting their career. Uh, so I think we've got to do something different and we've got to recognize the pressures on these working mothers who are trying to be teachers, who are trying to deal with schools and school, you know, sort of changing time schedules and all the other pressures in the world. Certainly men were affected too, but not at the same level as we're seeing females. So we're working diligently on that. We're focused on making sure that we provide sort of a customized um, program we're calling returnships. And I know there's lots of companies working on this that help those women get back into the workforce in a flexible way that allows them to balance both the, the polls at home and the polls in their personal life and, and the workforce because we don't wanna lose all these smart women. We wanna find ways to bring them back. And so we're focused, um, we're focused on that. We're focused on making sure our candidate pools are 50% females at the start. So we're not making hiring decisions if, if we're not doing that. And we're having to work harder right now. It's a much harder thing to recruit women into that pool, but it makes an enormous amount of difference. And we're doing some outreach and marketing to that group so that they understand that there is a home for them and that there are companies like us thinking about that balance and that they don't have to give everything up um, and that there's lots of flexibility and customization we can do. I love to hear all of that work because it's so important for women to continue in the workforce. Yes. Uh, well, Drew and Anne, I want to thank you so much for sitting down with us for this fireside chat. We appreciate the support in making this conversation happen. Before I bring on Senator Scott, we're going to watch another quick AIC video. I absolutely think that female entrepreneurs should look to private equity to help grow their business. I also think private equity needs to look to female founders to help grow their businesses. Yes, this company is female-led. We're also over 50% female, and that is unique in the beverage industry. We would not be in the same spot without private equity. I mean, this is a very capital-intensive business to be in. Private equity, what it means for us is the ability to really compete with the real players out there. What is private equity? This is private equity. All right, now I'd like to welcome Senator Tim Scott, the Republican from South Carolina, to join me. Senator Scott, thanks so much for being here today. Hello, Ann. Good to see you. Well, Drew and Ann and I were just talking about the economy and coming out of the pandemic. I'd love for you, though, from your vantage point, set the stage for us. What do you see the shape of the economy that, it, that it's in right now, June 10th, 2021? Yeah, I think the economy is doing better than most of us expected it would be doing at this point in time. I know the jobs report of uh, additional 559,000 uh, people coming back to work, unemployment falling to 5.8. That's a big part of the story. Perhaps a better part of the story is that it is our private sector is incredibly resilient, and no matter what the government does to or the government does for the private sector, the third and fourth quarter are going to be spectacular. The question that we should be asking ourselves is not how the immediate numbers look. It's what is the long term of the free enterprise system in our country, given the headwinds that could be created by bad policy. As you know, Ann, that certainty and predictability are absolutely essential for businesses to flourish. Good policy is better than bad policy, but certainty and predictability is what we need to be successful. And I think uh, right now our economy is moving in the right direction. Uh, besides the help from the government, it, it, I think it would be even better off, it, to be honest with you. Uh, there is a way for government action to slow down the economic activity. We see that through the extension of the unemployment benefits through the end of September. Uh, also, the glut of cash coming to the market is uh, hit inflation. It has an inflationary impact that is not helpful. And long term, uh, I do believe that we're going to have to wrestle with the unintended consequences of too much money too soon in a recovery that is too far down the road for this level of spending. Let's talk about that because uh, you talk about the resilience of the economy, but one of the big questions right now that uh, 
Washington is wrestling with is what happens with corporate tax rates, especially when it comes to Democrats trying to find ways to pay for a possible infrastructure deal. Uh, Republicans have been basically steadfastly against that. Uh, is there any increase you think you could support? Well, Ann, I'm kind of a simpleton, so no. <laughs> no, you are not. Sir, not at all. Uh, I will say this, that does not mean that they won't use the vehicle of reconciliation to get around uh, the necessity of 60 votes. I don't think they'd get to 60 votes for uh, the tax increases that they've uh, suggested. I mean, think about the impact on capital and how that translates to jobs in the marketplace. And frankly, if you go from 23.8 to 43.8 on the capital gains tax, you might as well remove the first three, four, five rungs on the ladder. It, it makes it very difficult for uh, new employees to get into a marketplace without jobs. Uh, and so that attack on capital would be uh, challenging at best. 21 to 28% uh, with our OECD uh, uh, competitors going down, not up. It's just a, the wrong direction. And then a new uh, yeah, global minimum tax. Uh, mm, well, we better just stop. Anna, sorry about that. No, no. Uh, well, I want to talk about the recovery a little bit. You've been a proponent, a strong supporter of opportunity zones pre-pandemic and continue to be. Talk a little bit about why you think they make sense. Anna, uh, the opportunity zones make a lot of sense because having been a kid growing up in poverty in a single parent household, I understand the potential that is in those uh, disenfranchised high poverty areas. Opportunity Zones brings the resources of the private sector and the genius of job creators back into the areas that need the help the most. I've often said that people see at-risk kids, I see high potential kids. And one of the ways to make sure that they maximize their potential is to bring opportunity within their grasp or within their reach. Opportunity Zones does that $75 billion uh, committed to those re to those areas of our country. We've seen, and I think it's been a 3% growth overall uh, from a wage growth before the pandemic. We're at 8% in some of the Opportunity Zones. We've seen a 20% increase uh, in the property values, and we've seen more jobs come in there. So the poverty rate's been going down within those zones faster than it has been around the country, even though in 2019, we had the lowest poverty rate recorded in the history of the country. Opportunity zones are an accelerant to more good things. And that is great news because the government, with all of our good intentions, we aren't good at creating jobs. The private sector creates jobs. We can help the playing field be more fruitful for job creation, but we don't really create jobs was looking at your home state of South Carolina. There's been a couple of areas, places where these opportunity zones have been implemented, including in Charleston, uh, yes. where there's a tech focused opportunity zone. What, I mean, you kind of talk broadly about just support for them and why they matter in, in, your, in your opinion, but in terms of those kind of specifics in your home state, are there lessons that you've learned or you think best practices that can be taken away from it? Well, there, there, there is a powerful opportunity with a public private partnership in the opportunity zones. Uh, the Charleston Tech Corridor is a classic example with $60 million being invested to create a uh, Silicon Harbor. We are, we are not, uh, we're not we're, there's no shame in our game, so to speak. With Silicon Valley's over there. We're next to the harbor. I like it. So not not Valley, there. Harbor. <laughs> Anna, you got that right. And, uh, and so we've seen the uh, attraction of more people in the tech field because today, we all know now that you can live and work anywhere you want to. And Charleston, the number one tourist destination in the nation for out of the last five years, is now home to more folks in the tech field. Uh, at the same time, in Hampton, South Carolina, which is a rural part of the state, I think over the last four or five years, they've had less than 1,500 jobs created in the rural parts. Because of the opportunity zones, there is an agricultural tech center that has created will create 1,500 permanent jobs 500 seasonal jobs in a county that hasn't done that in five years. Uh, and, and so literally, because of that public-private partnership, we are now going to be able to uh, create sustainable jobs and, frankly, high-quality food uh, for our country using technology and agriculture in a part of the South and the rural part of our country that is really important for us to recognize the opportunity there. And Anna, we all know that the fastest growing sector of entrepreneurs 
are in rural America. And so when you see the harmonizing of opportunity zones with, with smart public uh, officials who are making sure that the soil conditions are good, uh, we'll see an explosive opportunity grow out of those areas that desperately need uh, help and jobs. You focused a bit on the need to have reporting requirements when it comes to this kind of collaboration and what that should look like. Do you think more needs to be done uh, at the kind of federal level or is it kind of just time to go ahead and business as usual? Well, I do think there are two major opportunities on the federal level that I would like for us to take advantage of. One are those reporting requirements that you just alluded to. So important for us to be able to measure the success. I oftentimes say that measurable progress in reasonable time requires measurements. And once you can see the impact that's happen happening there, we'll be able to see why so many mayors are celebrating opportunity zones for the job creation and the economic development that's happening in their backyards. Investors are excited because they can chart the amount of ROI and governors have been really excited because that's more uh, revenue for the coffers. So it's the trifecta that is really important. The second uh, opportunity there, Anna, is for us to have a two-year extension so that there, are be, there will be more activity with the stepped up in bases making that more available again is necessary for us to have a two-year extension to attract even more investors uh, into the opportunity zones by that two-year extension. How long do you, how optimistic are you that this two-year extension could actually happen? Let us pray. <laughs> it's a tough one. Uh, we're gonna have to work, to work hard together on that. Uh, good news is I've, I've had some conversations with the White House about whether or not they will be supportive at all of opportunity zones and they are still very receptive. So I'm incredibly thankful for that. Uh, as you watch their tax plans come out, it, it, passing capital gains to much higher levels will be very hard to attract more capital into opportunity zones unless we preserve and then enhance some of the features of the stepped up in, in, in bases, which of course the current presentations uh, recommendations seem to be eliminating that. So that would have a devastating impact. So there are they are still at the table. Uh, we are discussing uh, some of the opportunities there. I hope that it continues to have traction. All right. Well, that will, time will tell. I'll be interested to see if that if the conversations are fruitful. Uh, before I let you go, I want to talk a little bit about just private equity in general and its investment in South Carolina. Six million dollars uh, in 2020. Uh, how big of an impact is that when you think about the state of South Carolina and its kind of you know overall e economic picture? Is that something that you are expecting to see grow, or do you kind of need that two-year extension in order to to kind of realize that those gains? Now, I, I think we'll see a lot of growth in opportunity zones and frankly, in private equity and job creation in my state, 168,000 jobs are supported by private equity. I think that number is only going to climb very quickly as people who used to come tour, visit and vacation, now they're making it their permanent home and their money follows with them. So I'm excited about the future of private equity in South Carolina markets like Charleston and Greenville are very hot uh, markets for private equity. To, to, to land and make a permanent home. So that means that the germination that's happening below the surface will, will then bear fruit on trees. Uh, so the future is very bright. Uh, I know that the impact that it's had nationwide has been substantial. I think South Carolina is on the cutting edge and momentum is behind us as it relates to seeing more activity uh, in this space. All right, and with that, I will let you go. Thank you so much, Senator. I know you have a very busy day. We appreciate you spending some of it with Punchbowl News. I also just want to say thank you to AIC again for making this conversation possible and to all of you for watching. We appreciate it. You can subscribe to Punchbowl News at punchbowl.news. Have a safe day and have a great day. Take care.